second. We're in a new series called uh, Embracing Exile. And we're going to talk about this. There's some in your message notes. But before we get into this, I thought I would tell you this story that would help you to understand what we mean by exile. In 2011, my wife and I were celebrating our anniversary, and it was only our 11th anniversary. And so we, you know, it's not like a big one. It's every anniversary is a big one, but it wasn't like a go on a trip anniversary. You know, it was like, let's go to dinner. So we, what we decided to do was spend the day together. So we were in Southern California. We uh, drove to Santa Monica, and we decided to rent bikes and go to Venice. How many of you have ever been to Venice? Venice Beach. Okay. And you go to Venice, not because you want to buy stuff, not because you want to eat food, but because it's weird, right? That's why you go to Venice, because it's just a strange place, and it's, it's fun. You know, you ride your bike through, and there's street art and street performers, and, and there's all kinds of crazy stuff happening in Venice. That's why you go. Well, we're in Venice, and we, you know, we're cruising around. We find this little farmer's market where you know, we found some cool little things. And, and then we, we both get hungry, and we go into some restaurant for lunch. I don't even know what it's called. It's just some restaurant. So we go into this restaurant, and they come around, and they, they give us all water. And that's good. That's what normally happens, right? We'll give you some water as you get a chance to read through the menu. So we're like, okay, cool. So we're there, we're looking at the menu, we're drinking our water, and somebody comes around with like a, a dropper, like for oil, and says, excuse me, sir, would you like some chlorophyll in your water? And I was, I, I looked at this person, it was so thrown at the back, and I was like, you mean like from science, chlorophyll? What do you mean chlorophyll? And they're like, yeah, from plants. And it was just this green substance that they were going to just dip in the water, and it turns your water green, and apparently it's really good for you. And I was like, no, I'll take my water straight. Thank you. This is very nice of you. And we looked at each other, and we were like, that was weird, right? Like, I've never, that's never happened to me before. Maybe it's just because we're in Venice. This is weird. So then I get up and go to the restroom, you know, halfway through the meal, and go, in, go to the restroom, and there are signs on the door of the restrooms that says this restroom is for those who are any gender and who don't know their gender and who are confused by gender and all that. And I thought, okay, it's good. That, that's nice of them to, to accommodate folks, I guess. But I, I'm calling old-fashioned, but I don't want to go to the bathroom in front of a lady. And so I was like, where's the men's room? Because I, I'm just petrified that I'm going to go into the bathroom and there's going to be a lady there. You know, I just, I, I'm old-fashioned that way, okay? I was able to use the bathroom without major incident. I came back to tell my wife, like, this is just a weird place. Like, we're in a different land. And then they bring the dessert cart by. And that's something you're always looking forward to at the meal, right? The dessert cart. But then we're noticing, like, the desserts are really expensive. Like, way more than your entrees. And we're like, why are these desserts so expensive? Well, it turns out when you bake drugs into the desserts, they just get way more expensive. And we were like, where are we? What's happening here? We're like in this bizarre world. We were experiencing cultural exile. A world like it looked like a restaurant, like any other restaurant. It, it looked like, you know, you walked in, they gave you water. That happens at every restaurant. It looked and felt normal until you got into the weeds of it. It was just a completely different place. We had experienced cultural exile. Many of you have probably experienced this lately, and, and nobody's experienced this more, I think, than the church right now. And we're going to talk about this in, in, in the following weeks, how the church is actually in cultural exile at the moment. And we need to talk about that, and we need to learn to embrace that spot where we are as a church, not just REC, uh, the church in general, because when you begin to look at things that have happened in the world Big, huge, famous pastors falling from grace, and the world seeing that and saying, see, we, this way, we can't go to church because of that. When, when, when the world makes no distinction and they, they, they see uh, the, the whole scandal in the Catholic Church, the church of not only the, the, the priests and sexual abuse, but covering it all up, they say, see, I, I can't be a part of that. They're not a moral organization at all. And so the church finds itself in further and further exile, losing its moral voice that it once enjoyed, that it once had. At one point, they would take 
the town pastor's sermons and print them in the newspaper and pass it all out to everybody every week. Like this was just normal. But the church is now in a very different place. And so this is why we're talking about exile. It's these moments in life that you wake up and you realize, wow, I'm in a different world. The, the, the world I grew up in is different than the world that it is now. It's a sense of feeling out of place. And in your notes, one of the ideas that exile is the idea that we feel displaced or even expelled from our true home. That's what exile is. And today what I want to do is, instead of diving deep into like where the church is at, we're going to do that in the following weeks. And, and how do we live in this sense of exile? What I want to do today and this is what I do with most sermon series, by the way. They build on each other. They're like pancakes. This is like the bottom pancake, okay? And then you're going to get the other pancakes and whipped cream at the top at the end. But this, this is the idea of what is exile in the Bible. How are we to understand this biblically first so that we could dissect it in the following weeks with how to live and what to do and all that stuff? And so and today what I want to do is spend a good little chunk of time to talk about this common thread through the Bible, which is simply exile. Many of us don't even realize like how the Bible was crafted. We've got this book, and it's a collection of 66 books. And, you know, you read it, and sometimes you go to your favorite verses. It's like, oh, let's go to John 3, 16. Let's go to Matthew. Let's do that. Let's, let's go to the epistles. Those are easy to read and fun to read. But we don't realize that the whole Bible was crafted in a state, really, of exile. We're going to talk about that this morning. So before we get there, the, one of the things I want us to understand is that the Jewish people, exile is the lens in which they saw everything. And as we get deep into the Old Testament today, I, I hope you'll see some of that. So you probably know the story of the Bible. So we're going to go through the story of the Bible just on a broad brush this morning. Humankind is in the garden. God plants this garden, and he planted humans into this garden, and they sin. They get banished. God forms a community out of this, this these people that have been banished out of the garden. Abraham, the community, becomes slaves in Egypt. They go to the promised land. In the promised land, Abraham's family forms the people of Israel Israel gets to the height of power, and then they become sinful, and then God carried them off to exile again. The story of the Bible is just littered with exile. It's like cast out of the garden. Cain and Abel are cast out. They go to Egypt. They're cast out. Everybody's cast out all the time. That, the story of the Bible is simply littered with this. People are carried off into exile into Babylon, uh, the, the people of Israel. And if you could picture, Babylon today is modern-day Baghdad, Iraq. That's where Babylon is. Babylon was an interesting world power in that most world powers conquered nations and used them as slaves and ways to make money. But they saw other nations as like cheap labor reserves. They saw other nations as military forces. But Babylon saw other nations as a source of knowledge and culture. And Babylon had one of the most extensive libraries of its time. They're one of the world powers that they wanted to conquer the world, but they wanted all the knowledge of the world too. That's what Babylon did. So back when they took these people into exile, they took the scholars, the best, the brightest, and they started writing down these stories. Stories like in 1 Kings and 2 Kings and Chronicles. and they, they started writing down these stories from the Bible that have just been oral tradition. They started writing them down so that people would always have the story of God. But they did this all through the lens of exile. Does that make sense to you? It's like they were all in exile and they wrote these stories down together. So it's almost like you see them through the lens of exile. Exile was like one of the most devastating things that could happen to you in the ancient world. In the ancient world, you had a tie to your land, a, a, a physical tie to your land, because that's where you buried your ancestors. That's where you built your homes. And, and homes would literally be passed down for generations and generations and generations. So in the land of Israel, exile was totally disruptive. One historian puts it this way, Deportations, 
totally disrupted life in the inhabited world for the first millennium. It was not enough to conquer or to annihilate every sign of human habitation to the ground. Not enough to cut down the trees and to burn crops in which they described as scorched earth policy. They disinterred the dead and removed the earth by removing the fertile topsoil, loading it on carts and taking it home with the expression with the expressed aim of ensuring that their name of their descendants, their remains and their offspring should no longer be on the lips of humanity. This is what they did. When Babylon and Assyria came in to Israel and wiped them out, they, they dug six feet down and even took the graves out because they didn't want anybody to have a tie back to their home. It's hard to be away from home. It's weird. It's disorienting. It's a strange thing to be in exile, and that's where the people of God found themselves, just in complete exile. So all the Bible was shaped by this sense that these people were deported. You hear it in the book of Daniel, like, right, Daniel goes with his friends. Uh, well, his friends, the, the other wise guys of Israel, they go off, they're carried off into exile, and they take the best and the brightest. That's what they did. So the academics, the priests, and the scribes all had this clear call from God to put together something that would help them to remember their own story. And that's where we get much of the Bible. And that's why I say exile is one of the most common themes and threads through all of it. Because the people who were called by God to write these stories, and the Holy Spirit spoke through them to write these stories out, they were all in captivity. One of the chief fears of going into exile, and it's probably the chief fear today, was not that these exiles would never come home. But would they be raising children that looked more like Babylon and less like their Jewish culture? And I feel like that's one of the chief fears of our kids today too, right? Like, will our kids continue to follow Jesus or are they just going to turn into to microcosms of the culture that we live in? Will our kids stand firm in following Jesus in a world that does not affirm Jesus? Will our kids stand firm in their faith and their values and their marriages? Will our kids do that or will they just end up looking like the rest of the world? And this is why exile, the theme of it, is so important. It, it, it speaks to where we are as a church and as a church how we need to actually work on shaping culture not being shaped by it. And you're going to hear that a lot from me. So the Old Testament, like I said, is birthed out of this oppression. The event of exile was so prolific in their lives because of these exiles who carefully and painstakingly took all these texts and put them together into the Bible. Exile becomes a common set of glasses in which we can look at the Bible. It, it literally is the story of all of us. Exile reminds us that there is a true home that God wants for us, that there is a true north, but we're not in it right now. Exile reminds us that there is true justice, but we're not experiencing it right now. Exile reminds us all of that. So in the following weeks, we'll get into this idea of the church in exile. But in order to understand that, what we need to understand is the theological idea itself. I know that's not a very exciting sentence, right? How many times has somebody said, oh, let's understand this theological idea. Let's break it down. And people are like, yes. That's just guys like me, right? Hopefully you too. That's why some of you wanted sermon notes. So let's get into it right now. Where this idea originates in Scripture is where every idea originates in Scripture. Shocker, right? The first pages of the Bible, Genesis 1. When you read the biblical account of Eden, you can see that this is humanity's true home. In, in fact, there's interesting things to read about in Eden, like humans are at peace with the animals, right? There's this other interesting piece about the Garden of Eden that unless you like really dig into it, you might just read right over. Humans ate plants, every seed-bearing plant, and animals only ate shrubs and greenery. No one lived at the expense of one another in the Garden of Eden. Nobody had to eat each other to live. 
everything, humans and animals just lived at peace with each other. And not only that, God lived at peace with them too. This is the, the, this is the Eden ideal. Humanity's true home. The way that God had intended for all humanity to live with him and at peace with everyone. Eden becomes such a huge theme in the Bible that the very last page of the Bible, of Revelation, talks about this new Eden coming down from heaven. So Eden is not a small theme. Jesus, when he's having conversations with the Pharisees about marriage and they ask him a question, he goes, it's not so, look back to Eden. Eden becomes one of the core themes of Jesus' teachings even. Eden is a very important place in Scripture. It reminds us that it is our true home. And one of the things that we see in the Garden of Eden are the three essential relationships, right? And we're going to look at these. So if you, I put them on your notes this morning. So if you want to look at your notes, the first one is God and man. And the word man there really is God and humanity, mankind. So ladies, you're not excluded from this. It's just the way the word that I'm using for all humanity. God and mankind. That's the first essential relationship. We see verses like man and God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, that man is made in the image of God. It's the first essential relationship in the garden. The second essential relationship is man and woman. Genesis 2, 22 through 25, it talks about we know, and what we know is that women and man and woman were in the Bible, or in the garden, they were naked, unashamed. They were married. They had a great relationship at first before the whole sin deal happened. And then lastly was man and creation. And I just talked about this for a little bit, right? That, that the earth like served humankind. I'm a big fan of C.S. Lewis. And when I took my sabbatical, one of the... Um, books I read was his nerdier book called the, or Paralandria, the Space Trilogies. Anybody ever read the Space Trilogies by C.S. Lewis? All right, a couple of you. Good job. Of course, Jeremiah read the Space Trilogies. <laughs> but it, but Paralandria is like this, 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 uh, it's, it's a name for Venus, and, and this guy named Ransom, this character, goes to, to Paralandria, this other planet, and it's like, Everything is just so fruitful, and, and the, the planet just, just gives life to the people walking in. It's this idea of this unfallen world. I just, I just summed up like a 200-page book for you. You don't have to read it now. No, I'm joking. You should all go read it. It's really good. But you've got you to gotta filter through all the, uh, the science fiction stuff of it. The idea, though, is that humanity is at true home with creation. And, and now, and, and believe me, this is not me trying to be political or anything like that. We see now creation being turned upside down. In, in many ways, in many places around the world, creation is just sort of flipped upside down. And we've sort of used creation and not protected it the way that we should have. And that's not me intending to be political. That's just the truth. I mean, there's a garbage patch the size of Texas in the middle of the, the Pacific Ocean. God didn't put that there, Right? The idea is that we are no longer at peace with these three things. These three things have been broken in such a way now that we're experiencing exile in these three core relationships. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 8, and we're going to look at the breaking and the fall of these relationships. Genesis 8, we're, we're going to go from verses... Uh, Chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. I'm getting my numbers all confused this morning. I'm sorry. It says this. Then the man and the wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. So the backstory is humankind had already decided to define good on their own terms. They already ate the fruit that was forbidden, and God came, and where they normally had this relationship where God and humankind could just walk in the garden together, Adam realizes his own nakedness, his own shame, and, he, and he, the first relationship is broken. The relationship between God and man. 
And then verse 11, and he said, who told you that you were naked? I didn't know you had to have people tell you that. Like, but first people, okay, makes sense. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Then the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate it. I mean, you don't have to be a marriage and family therapist to realize what was wrong with that sentence, right? <laughs> like you just know, like dude's in trouble tomorrow. The woman gave it to me. Now there's not just a strain between man and God, but now Eve has given Adam the side eye, right? She's like, sure, you're going to blame it on me. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and so I ate it. You see how the blame game just keeps going here. Adam was like, no, it's the woman. And Eve's like, no, 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 it's the serpent over there. They, they deceived me, and, and now I, I just, I, it was their fault. So humanity and God, God, man and woman, man and creation, these three core relationships that are foundational in the beginning of the story of Scripture are now broken. And humanity is walking away from these core relationships. I think if we're really honest, we could see the effects of these broken relationships in our own lives. The very fact that you come to church reveals that you need God, right? That you're seeking after God on a weekly basis. For some of you, you've been doing that for years. For some of you, this might be your first time in church that you're seeking after the Lord. And that's awesome because you know that there's some brokenness there. Maybe there's some stuff that you've done in your own life and you realize there's some brokenness there between God and me. And, and that needs to be healed. Two, we see the effects of human conflict in this world and everywhere. Right? That, that second relationship between man and woman, not only do you see that breakdown happening in your own families, but you start to see that breakdown happening in a larger section of our world. We live in a world that's not in the garden anymore. And three, like I just mentioned, you, you begin to see the effects of humanity and creation. You begin to see that effect happening. As we keep going, we jump down to verse 22, chapter 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden and to work the ground from which it had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of the Eden cherubim and a flaming sword and flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So God expelled, he banished humankind from the garden. And there's three key words in here that help us to understand and know that this is an exile story. This is the very first exile of the Bible. And in English, I, I put these words on your notes. And one of the reasons why I put these words in Hebrew in your notes is because, like, if you're reading the Bible in English, you won't care about that, what, what it says in Hebrew. But the first readers, when they're reading this in Hebrew, they're seeing these words all through the Bible. So to them, as they're reading uh, other parts of the Bible, they go back and they go, oh, that's, that's banished. That's what happened in Genesis 1. As they're reading the Bible, they begin to see this. So the, these three words are banish, shalak, garash, drive out, and kadem, east. And these three words just play out over and over and over again in Scripture. We see it happen in the very first relationship and the very first thing in the garden. They get pushed out. They go eastward. Humanity goes east. And you begin to see it. The next story in the Bible, Genesis 4, 1 through 14. Today you're driving me out from the land. You're garroshing me from the land. I will be hidden from your presence. I will be restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Genesis 4, 16. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. All of humanity goes east. It's this idea that we begin to see in the Bible over and over and over again that the people of God begin to move eastward towards Babylon. Then you begin to see Genesis 11. 
So from, from the garden, every single move goes eastward towards Babylon. Genesis 11.1, 1, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. So Genesis 11 is this picture of the whole world moving away from the garden. The whole world moved eastward and they settled in Babel. Now the Hebrew word for Babel is Babel. Shocker, I know. And the Hebrew word for Babylon is Babel. So the, the whole idea is that the authors are trying to tell us is they went from God's presence in Eden to now to Babylon. And they're very far off from where God wanted them. The whole earth now is living in a state of exile. All of humanity is now in exile under Babylon. They're living far away from the world as it should be. Babylon is the world or the culture in which you wake up and realize, I'm not at home anymore. It's the world in which you wake up in now and go, what happened here? This is so different. It's like somebody dropping chlorophyll into your water. You're like, what is this? This is Babylon. There's a lot of conversation today about what is modern day Babylon. It's a culture that unites around human authority. It's a culture that mocks God by pretending he doesn't exist. It's a culture that's, that's right in their own eyes. You live in it and you breathe it, and every single day we're in exile. You, you're living in a world where the culture finds new ways to celebrate sin. This is Babylon. It's not like America or another country. It's the human condition apart from God. And this is what the Bible says. So outside of the garden, the idea, what, Bible, what the Bible's trying to tell us is outside of the garden of God, we're all exiles. We're all exiles. But there's this one family in the Bible that desires to take us to our true home again. And this is what God is doing in Scripture. He's, he's trying to bring us back to those three core relationships, Right? where we're good with God, where, where our relationship with God is settled and set and, and good and there's forgiveness there, where our relationship with others is good, settled and set and there's forgiveness there and where our relationship with creation is good as well. This one family in the Bible is the family of Abraham. And I love what the text says. When, when you look at Hebrews, the, the writer of Hebrews was actually trying to do a little bit extra commentary on this. It says this, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to a place where he would later receive his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder was God. So in Genesis 11, all humanity has moved out of the garden towards Babel, to this unholy city, right? And what the author of Hebrews is telling us is that God is now using Abraham to move all of humanity back to Canaan. It's actually westward from where they were, just in case you were curious. And the idea is that Abraham was going to bring about this revolution of human community that would eventually lead all of humanity out of exile. The author of Hebrews says that he's leading him towards a city whose foundations and architect and the builder is God. Literally, there's this great comparison in the first 11 chapters of the Bible. Do you want to live in this human-based exile, in this corruption called Babylon, or do you want to go westward with Abraham? What is it that you want? See, the idea here is that Abraham is the father of all people. He is the, he is the father of the people of God. He was one with God in faith. He was the father of Israel. He made a covenant with God, and his family would begin to show the way to freedom. This is who Abraham was, even though he had flaws. So Abraham's family is eventually called Israel, and eventually ends up in Egypt, and then eventually ends up... Uh, building this massive empire in Jerusalem, and then it eventually ends up going back into exile again. So who can save these people who continually wind up in exile? But Abraham has this family member thousands of years later. This guy named Jesus 
who, and I love the way that the text says it in Matthew 4, verses 14 through 17. It says, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, I, I hate saying these, some of these words, by the way. As a pastor, I should be like the best at these words, but I sit in my office and try and say them, and I'm terrified. Okay. The way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee to the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And Jesus, what's so amazing here, this, this text, what's going on here is that it's being quoted from Isaiah, and the idea is that people from east of, of the land of Jordan are now being called to see a great light and to move back westward, right? This is Jesus. He's the great leader of freedom out of the exile. And so all through the Bible, you see this, this whole idea, right? There's the garden, there's sin, and then people move east away from God's presence. They keep moving east, and they go to Babel, and they, God sets up this family, and he kind of brings them back, but then they go east again until Jesus comes. And he brings ultimate redemption between God and and humanity, ultimate redemption in bringing forgiveness into the human relationships. And he leads us to live at peace with our world, not just like the created part of our world, but humankind in our world. That's what Jesus leads us to do, is to live at peace with the world. So today, as we begin to wrap this up, what I really want you to see today is that exile is the story of all of us. It's the story, whenever you find yourself in a place and you're like, I don't belong here. This is weird. This isn't my true home. God is like, I have a true home for you. Whenever you're in that restaurant and somebody's offering you a brownie with weird stuff cooked into it, and you're like, this is so strange. Where am I? You're in exile. You're in cultural exile. It's a world you don't belong to anymore. God has set eternity into your heart to realize I don't belong here. Maybe there's some things in your life this morning that are kind of holding you in exile. Maybe there's some things in your life this, this morning that maybe between you and your relationship with God, you've been holding on to something in your hand and, and you have not been letting it go, but you know that if you let this go between you and God, you guys would not be in exile anymore, that you and God would have a great relationship. And you just need to lay that at the foot of the cross. And you could, you could God wants to restore that first relationship with you and him. That, that, that your relationship could be redeemed, restored. It could be like it was not Eden. That God could walk with you in the cool of the day and be with you and closer than the air that you breathe. That's what God wants for you. He could pull you out of exile this morning. Out of those strange places, he could pull you out. But you need to let that go. Maybe you're here today and your relationship with others is in exile today. And you know it. Every time you see somebody, you're like, oop, going to go the other way. Your relationships are in exile. Your relationship with God is good, but your relationships with others just stinks. And like, God wants to redeem that too. And the path of coming out of exile in those relationships is simply forgiveness. God wants that to happen in your life too. And maybe you're here today and the rest of creation, not just plants and animals, but what I'm saying is literally people outside the church, people who are non-Christians, uh, people, you, you've just insulated yourself from it your whole life. You've been in church your whole life, and there's people that are out there that don't know Jesus, and you've sort of said, oh, all my friends are Christians, all my family is Christians, I, I'm good. Well, guess what Jesus did? He sought after those people. Jesus got in trouble seeking after people who were not in yet. Would you go get in trouble seeking after people who have not followed Jesus yet? Are you willing to do that? Maybe your relationship with the outside world is in exile this morning. So maybe you're here in, in one of those three areas. I want to invite you to just a time of decision and prayer. Maybe your first step is out of exile is putting your trust in in Jesus. And that could happen with a prayer. 
And if you do that, if you want to put your trust in Jesus today, I want to invite you to come talk to me or one of the other pastors because there's next steps that need to happen there. Maybe you're here today and your next step out of exile is reconciling with somebody else. And you can't do anything else until you go reconcile with that person. I want to invite you to go do that today too. You don't need any special skills. All you need to know how to do is say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Or maybe you're here today and the path out of exile is beginning to share your faith again and living in such a way that is unashamed of the gospel. Would you pray with me right now? Father God, we are a people who are in exile, who woke up one morning at that restaurant that was just strange and weird. Like that's, we live in a world that no longer sees you as God, no longer sees the Bible as relevant, no longer sees what your word is as truth. And God, we're living in this world and it's disorienting. It's challenging. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand what is going on really in this world. Lord, there, there might be some folks here today who simply need to put their trust in you. And if that's you, I just want to invite you to just say, God, I trust what you've done on the cross. I put my hands into your life. I put my life into your hands. And I ask that you would forgive me of my sins and help me to walk anew with you today, God. Father, there might be some people here who need to reconcile with each other. Lord, and we just pray that for those relationships right now, that you would reconcile them to one another. God, that you would melt hearts that have been stones for so long and that they would desire your forgiveness. And Father, maybe for some, they're, they're here today, they're, they're, they just need to, to begin sharing their faith and living unashamed. God, we pray for courage and boldness for those people. And God, each, I believe each one of these steps will help lead us out of exile and deeper and closer into relationship with you. So use us now, oh God. Speak to us and help us to live out your word. In the name of Jesus.